Well, welcome to our Sunday evening message. Uh, we're continuing to go through the Westminster uh, Confession of Faith, and today we will look at chapter 27 on the sacraments. Uh, on the sacraments, this is a five section. Uh, if you have your Trinity hymnal, it is on page 864 on your Trinity hymnal. Uh, sacraments are holy signs and seals of the covenant of grace immediately instituted by God to represent Christ and his benefits and to confirm our interest in him, as also to put a visible difference between those that belong unto the church and the rest of the world, and solemnly to engage them to the service of God in Christ according to his word. There is in every sacrament a spiritual relation or sacramental union between the sign and the thing signified. Whence it comes to pass that the names and effects of the one are attributed to the other. The grace which is exhibited in or by the sacraments rightly used is not conferred by any power in them. Neither doth the efficacy of a sacrament depend upon the piety or intention of him that doth administer it, but upon the work of the Spirit and the word of institution." which contains, together with a precept authorizing the use thereof, a promise of benefit to worthy receivers. There be only two sacraments ordained by Christ our Lord in the gospel, that is to say, baptism and the supper of the Lord, neither of which may be dispensed by any, but by a minister of the word lawfully ordained. The sacraments of the Old Testament, in regard of the spiritual things, thereby signified and exhibited, were for substance the same with those of the new. Uh, today, basically, I want to boil this uh, chapter down on sacrament, sacraments into two categories. First, signs and seals. Second, the sacraments are given to us by God. And then third, and finally, I want to deal with this important phrase that the confession gives us here, and that is sacramental Union. So the sacraments as signs and seals, the sacraments as those that have been given to us by God, and then that uh, concept of sacramental union, a very important concept. So first, uh, the confession states that uh, the sacraments are signs and seals. The confession says that the sacraments are signs and seals of the covenant of grace. Uh, we get this language of signs and seals in Romans 4, verse 11. Uh, Abraham, he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. And the confession, as we will probably see next week, would see baptism as a replacement of circumcision in the Old Covenant and baptism as a replacement in the New Covenant and all four sacraments, the two in the old being circumcision and Passover, and the two in the new, baptism and the Lord's Supper, all of them together uh, find their definition in that language of signs and seals of the uh, uh, covenant of grace. Essentially what the confession is saying here is that the plan of redemption has always been the same. It is always centered on the grace of God, manifested in Jesus Christ. And the two primary sacraments of the Old Testament, circumcision and Passover, were pointing ahead to Christ, while baptism and the Lord's Supper are pointing back to what Christ has accomplished and the spiritual benefits uh, that flow from his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. This is why in section 5, the very last section of this chapter, uh, the confession says the sacraments of the Old Testament in regard of the spiritual things thereby signified and exhibited were for substance the same with those of the new. In other words, what the confession is stating here is that circumcision and Passover have the same spiritual realities. They have the same substance, namely Christ, undergirding them, just as baptism and the Lord's Supper has. 
circumcision and Passover pointing ahead to Christ, baptism and Lord's Supper pointing back to what Christ has accomplished, signifying and sealing the benefits that flow from God's grace in and through Jesus Christ. And these sacraments are signs and seals of God's grace exhibited in and through Jesus Christ. And I just want to go briefly through those two words, sign and seal. First, sign. The sacrament points to something beyond itself. It is pointing to a spiritual reality and a person, namely Jesus Christ. Think of a sign in in our everyday world. Think of a, a stop sign. There's nothing intrinsically powerful about the hunk of metal or the shape of a a stop sign, but what makes the stop sign important is the reality that it is pointing to, the reality of stopping, or perhaps the reality of getting a ticket or uh, getting in an accident. Uh, Baptism points to the reality of Christ washing away our sins, by his blood. The Lord's supper supper points to the shed blood and broken body of Christ that takes away our sin. So it is a sign in the sense that it is pointing to a reality uh, beyond itself. It is meant to point to a spiritual reality, the spiritual benefits of Jesus Christ and his person and work. Second, it's a seal. Simply put, a seal validates something. A seal protects a promise. It validates the words given by the promise giver. Think for a moment of uh, what God will promise to Noah after the flood. He promises to Noah that he will never again flood the earth due to man's sin. And in order to validate and confirm that promise in the heart and mind of Noah, God gives him the rainbow. The rainbow is a seal of God's promise to Noah. Noah is to look at that rainbow and see that God is confirming and validating through that visual sign his promise never again to flood the earth. So it is a seal of God's promise to us. So one would maybe put it like this. A sacrament is a sign which is a distinguishing mark that points to something which exists, and a seal confirms or authenticates the genuineness of that thing that the sign is pointing to. And with the sign and seal language, what is being brought out is the fact that the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper are only understood in reference to the word of God, in reference to the word of promise that lies behind the sacrament itself. In other words, baptism and the Lord's Supper is not like some magical potion. It's not like some pill that you can take and and you'll be better because you take it, simply because of the elements mingled together within that pill, kind of like what I have just said concerning a stop sign. There's nothing intrinsically magical, magical about the sign, about that hunk of metal. Uh, Baptism is just water, nothing magical about it. The Lord's Supper is just wine and bread, nothing magical or, or medicinal about it. Uh, Its significance is only tied to the word of promise that it points to, to the word of promise that it signifies and validates. This is why the confession uh, can say only a minister uh, should ordinarily administer the sacraments. Only a minister lawfully ordained should administer baptism and the Lord's Supper because... It is a teaching ordinance. It is a teaching ordinance. It is a word-based ministry. 
similar to the proclamation of the word of God. Within the public gathering of God's people, only those who are lawfully ordained are called to proclaim God's word to the public gathering of God's people. And the sacraments, as Augustine would put it, are the visible word of God. They are the word of God brought before our eyes, brought before our senses. And the Lord's Supper brought before our taste buds. And just as only those who are rightfully ordained to the ministry are to proclaim God's word within the public gathering of God's people, so also only those uh, who are rightfully ordained should administer the sacraments, the visible word of God to the public gathering of God's people. So the confession and the writers of the confession uh, saw the sacraments, as Augustine would put it years earlier, as visible words. They only find their value uh, in the words of promise and the substance that they point to and validate. And it takes the teaching and instruction in apostolic doctrine in order to convey the special nature of those sacraments. And only those who are lawfully ordained uh, to proclaim God's word, to teach and instruct the apostolic doctrine within the public gathering uh, are those ministers. So also only they should administer the sacraments. So we see that the sacraments are a sign and seal of God's covenant grace. Second, the sacraments are given to us by God. The sacraments are given to us by God. Genesis 17, clearly it is God. We'll look at Genesis 17 in a little bit, but clearly it is God that institutes circumcision for Abraham. In the book of Exodus, God clearly is the one that institutes the Passover. Uh, with the Lord's Supper, it is Christ that institutes the Lord's Supper. And in Matthew 28, verse 19, with the Great Commission, it is clearly Christ that commands baptism and institutes baptism. In other words, the direction of the sacrament is God down to us, not us up to God. The direction of the sacraments are God with an arrow pointing down to us, not us with an arrow pointing up to God. It is God giving us a signpost of his grace in Jesus Christ. It is God giving us validation of his grace and his word of promise in Christ. It is not, first and foremost, us making a promise to God. It is, first and foremost, God validating and pointing to his gracious promises to us in the gospel of his Son. Now, what the confession state is stating here is actually uh, very much contrary to what we see today in much of modern-day evangelicalism. Uh, as modern-day evangelicalism approaches the sacraments, especially baptism. Baptism is very much a me making a commitment to God. It is a sign and seal of me and my commitment to God, rather than a sign and seal of God's commitment to us. That's why you have people oftentimes getting baptized three or four or five different times because they think the first time didn't really take because they didn't feel that commitment to God. But what is that actually conveying? It's conveying a backward understanding of the sacraments, a backward understanding of baptism as a sign and seal, not first and foremost of my commitment to God, but a sign and seal of God's commitment to his people. And any spiritual efficacy to the baptism is not tied to my commitment to God. That's why the confession says it's not based on the power that rests within that makes that sacrament spiritually efficacious to me. But it is tied to the Holy Spirit working in the hearts of those who receive the sacrament so that they might worthily receive it. 
Section 3 states, The grace that is exhibited in or by the sacraments rightly used is not conferred by any power in them, neither does efficacy of the sacrament depend upon the piety or intention of him that does administer it, but upon the work of the Spirit. In other words, going back to the sacraments as the visible word of God, the sacrament's positive effect, therefore, is the same as the word of God and its effect. Just as the word of God, for it to be planted within the heart of an individual, the Holy Spirit must be tied to it. The word of God is the Holy Spirit's vehicle that he uses to drive into the heart of the dead sinner, giving them life and light so that word can have its impact, so that word can take root. So also the word of God conveyed visually through the sacrament is only efficacious when the Holy Spirit binds the gospel promises that are signified and sealed to the heart of the receiver. For example, every Sunday when I come here and and get ready to proclaim God's word, I I pray that God would, would bind his Holy Spirit to the faithful proclamation of his word, that the Holy Spirit would would come and and, and knit all of your hearts, my heart included, to the word of God, that his word would not come back to him void. So also with the sacraments, I pray that the gospel signified and sealed would penetrate the hearts of the hearers, not by the work and the commitment of the individuals, but by the work and commitment of God through his Holy Spirit. Third and finally, sacramental union. Sacramental union. In section two, we read, there is in every sacrament a spiritual relation or sacramental union between the sign and the thing signified. Whence it comes to pass that the names and effects of the one are attributed to the other. Now, I just want to close tonight and consider what it is the confession is trying to say concerning uh, this phrase, sacramental union. Basically, what the confession is seeking to do here is deal with those passages that deal with the sacraments, both in the old and in the new, where the sacrament is spoken of as the thing signified. Uh, We could be tempted with these passages, and I'm about to give a a couple of examples of them, where we read them and we do treat those sacraments as some sort of magical potion, as the thing that actually changes us because of the language that the biblical writers use. And what the confession wants to say is how we interpret those passages is through our understanding of this sacramental union, a spiritual relation between the sign and the thing signified. Uh, So uh, I want to give a few examples here. First, in the Old Testament, in Genesis 17, 10, at the institution of uh, circumcision with Abraham, God will say of circumcision, this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. Take note of the language there. This is my covenant. And then he goes on to explain what the covenant is. And he says it's circumcision. But we know from Genesis 12 and Genesis 15 and even earlier in Genesis 17 that his covenant and his covenant promises isn't boiled down in circumcision. He gives his covenant promises through his word delivered to Abraham. And what the confession is saying about such passages as this is that it's not that the sacrament actually is the Abrahamic promise, but the sacrament is closely knit to the promise of the covenant, that the sacrament is spoken of as though it is the covenant and the promises of the covenant itself. There's a sacramental union between the sign and the thing signified. 
Another example is with the language connected to baptism in the New Testament. For example, 1 Peter 3, verse 21. Peter says, Baptism now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, is Peter there contradicting what Paul will say in Romans 10, verse 9 through 10? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Is Peter saying there in, in 1 Peter 3, nope, baptism is what saves you. Of course not. He's rather tying the sign to the thing signified, and he is speaking of the sign as though it were the thing signified in a similar way as God does in Genesis 17 with circumcision. Now, where this concept of sacramental union is so important is with the Lord's Supper. What does Jesus say? When he raises up the bread and he raises up the cup, he says, this is my body. This is my blood. Uh, From those words of institution have come many, many, many misguided notions of how we are to understand that those words of Jesus and that sacrament of the Lord's Supper. First, there is Roman Catholicism. A Roman Catholicism would take the position that the bread and wine literally become the body and blood of Jesus Christ, what is known as the doctrine of transubstantiation. But even within Protestant circles, especially during the time of the Reformation, there was heated debate on how we are to understand Jesus' language uh, concerning the bread and the wine. In fact, it is because of the Lord's Supper that Luther and Kelvin eventually parted ways. Not because Kelvin wanted to. Luther was very much a hero of the faith for Kelvin, but Luther just could not take Kelvin's stance on the Supper, and he ended up uh, really leaving, in many ways, uh, Kelvin because of it. Uh, Luther agreed with Kelvin and even Zwingli that the elements were a sign but that the things signified, namely Christ's body and blood, were in, under, and with the sacraments, what is called consubstantiation, the word con meaning with. So Luther didn't want to get as, uh, go as far as transubstantiation with Rome, but he still wanted to say that Christ's actual physical body is very, very close and near to those elements. On the opposite extreme, on the opposite end, you had Ulrich Zwingli, the great Swiss reformer, who took what we often call the memorialist view of the supper. Uh, And he attached more of really what we might call a metaphorical meaning to the bread and to the wine, similar to, say, Jesus' words in John 15, where Jesus says, I am the vine. Clearly, that's metaphorical. And Zwingli would say we are to take that same sort of metaphorical usage to the words of Jesus. I, this is my body, this is my blood. Kelvin and the Reformers, on the other hand, understood what the Confession states says here, that there is a sacramental union between the sign and the thing signified. Christ's words of institution is sacramental language that is found throughout the Bible. Just as circumcision wasn't the covenant itself, but was closely tied to the covenant and its promises, so also the bread and the wine are not the body and blood of Christ, but are closely tied to the promises that that body and blood spell for all those that faithfully receive. So against Luther, they would say the bread remains bread, And they would say the wine or the juice remains wine and juice. Christ's body remains at the right hand of God the Father. It is not literally becoming the the bread and the wine, and it's not in, with, and under the bread and the wine. But against Zwingli, 
they would say it's a lot deeper than simply metaphorical language, just as, say, John 15, where Jesus says he is the vine. When Jesus says he is the vine, he doesn't then say, make sure you eat the vine in remembrance of me. He doesn't say, go make disciples of all nations and make sure everybody eats the vine. No, he's not using the vine in that way. In other words, he isn't tying sign and seal language to the vine and giving it to the people as a token of his grace. It's not mere metaphor. It's a sacrament, a sign and seal of the covenant of grace. Praise be to God that our raised up King, Jesus Christ, validates his promises to us and gives us a physical, visible sign of all the goodness that flows from his life, death, and resurrection. God bless.